Jesus Christ. The exact words as he stood up on the mountainside and preached the Bible, we can hear it, we can read it today. God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts through the message this morning. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now before I get into the sermon, let me read for you a few other verses. Stay in Matthew 6, but the Bible reads in 1 Samuel 12, 23, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Did you hear that? God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. And then in James chapter 4, verse 2, the Bible reads, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask and miss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. So according to the Bible, it is a sin not to pray. Did you hear that? Samuel said, if I were to cease to pray for you, he was a leader in Israel, he was the judge at the time, and he said, if I cease to pray for you, it would be a sin against God himself. And then the Bible tells us in James chapter 4 that the reason we don't have some of the things that we desire to have is because we don't ask for those things. He says, you lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, you fight in war, yet you have not, because you ask not. And then he says, you ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lusts. Now look down in your Bible, Matthew chapter 6, where we were just reading. Look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now I want to talk about prayer this morning, and how important prayer is, and what prayer can get you. Now, in verses 7 and 8 here, I'm sorry, verse number 5 and 6 here, he talks about how the most important prayer that you do is not some kind of a public prayer. You know, we go to a restaurant, would you say a word of prayer before we eat? We pray for the food. We come to church here. I've already prayed three times in the service this morning. But God is saying here that the important prayer that you do is not praying that you do with anybody else. It's not something that you do publicly so that everybody can see you. It's a prayer that's done in your closet alone. Why? Because if you ever thought about this, prayer really doesn't make any sense unless there's really a God. I mean, unless God is real, it means nothing. You could say, well, uh, reading the Bible, going to church. People might have ulterior motives for why they come to church. Or why they read the Bible. Or why they do a lot of things that they do for an outward show. To have glory of men. To be seen of men. But there's really nothing to gain at all, humanly speaking, by going into your closet shutting the door, getting on your knees, and praying to your Father, which is in secret, hey, but if there's a real God in heaven, it's going to listen to what you pray, it's going to answer your prayer. It's the power of God. Now, prayer requires more faith than almost anything in the Christian life, because you're not going to see any kind of a physical result from your prayer unless there's really a God. I mean, what do you gain? Nobody sees you doing it, right? I mean, do you know how much I pray? Do I know how much you pray? Nobody knows. It's the one thing... Now, you say, well, uh, people don't know how much I read the Bible. We can probably tell how much you read the Bible by the things that come out of your mouth. You can tell how much I read the Bible by my knowledge or lack thereof. But one thing that you can't tell is whether somebody prays or not. This is something that's between you and God. But it's a way for you to get God to do the things that you want Him to do. You say, well, is that what prayer is about? Well, do you know what the word pray means? Look up the word pray in the Bible. You know, the first time the word pray is used, it's not talking about praying to God. It's one person asking another human being for something and saying, I pray thee, would you do thus and so for me? And you'll see that usage throughout the Bible. Pray, simply in our language, would mean ask. I pray thee, I ask thee, would you do this for me? Now, if you were to get on your knees and speak to God, but not ask for anything, have you prayed? No, you haven't prayed. Now, you could, you could get on your knees and say, God... Thank you for all the wonderful things that you've done for me. Thank you for being such a great God and for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have you prayed? No, God, you didn't ask for anything. Okay? You were praising God, and that's important. You know, you were giving thanks to God, you were rejoicing, but you're not praying unless you're asking something. The purpose of praying is asking for something. Flip over in your Bible one chapter over to Matthew 7, 
And this is what prayer is about. Look at verse 7. This is prayer. Act 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Now, what's the purpose of asking? So that something will be given to you. So that it will be done for you. That's what the purpose of prayer is, to get something, to get a response. Okay? Uh, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? See, that's the key. Them that ask him. You see, I just think God's just going to give good things to all of his children. Well, not unless you ask, according to the Bible. If you ask not, you're going to have not. Period. Now, a lot of people think, well, we just pray. And, and I've, heard, I've heard some strange things in my life coming across the pulpit, you know. And people say, like, well, you know, God's going to do what He's going to do anyway. But you just pray, and then you can feel like He did it because you asked Him. I mean, I've, I've actually heard somebody say that. I mean, if people are going to get saved, they're going to get saved anyway. Whether you go tell them the gospel or not, God will find a way to get them saved. But if you tell them, then you got to have a part in it. You get the blessing of being there. That's just not true. That's not true at all. No, people, people die and go to hell because people, nobody preaches them the gospel. That's the whole reason why we do what we do. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. And the reason that we pray is not just some kind of an exercise. Well, well it was going to happen anyway, but if I pray for it and then it happens, then I can chalk it up as God did it for me. And then that's an answer to prayer. That's ridiculous. If I didn't think that prayer would do, make some kind of a change, then why would I pray? If I didn't feel like God was going to answer me as a result of my praying, why would I take the time to pray? It wouldn't make any sense, would it? It'd be like, you know, you walk up to the sink and say, God, I pray that you would make hot water come out. When I turn on the sink, and you turn on the hot water, because God answered my prayer. (laughs) I mean, that's kind of silly, isn't it? Isn't that ridiculous? Oh, God, let my car start! You know, it's like a brand new 2007. Now, some people, may, you, maybe you do need to pray before you start your car. But, you know, you're driving some 2006, 2007. Oh, God, help it to start. That's not what prayer is. I mean, prayer is when you ask for something that you need, okay? And God supernaturally comes through and answers your prayer for you. That's what prayer is. But back in Matthew chapter 6, flip back over, we'll, we'll finish this passage. This is kind of the introduction to the sermon. But look at verse number 7. Of Matthew 6, the Bible reads, but, but, see, God's telling you it's vital that you pray, but there's a way that you need to pray. But, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. Do you hear that? Don't chant things. Don't repeat things over and over. Uh, You know, the Roman Catholics... Yes, the Roman Catholics, you know what they do? They have beads and they have prayers on a piece of paper. And what do they do? They chant. Why? Because they're heathens. Yes, they are. And so what do they do? They chant the same prayers over and over again. They're using a vain repetition. They say the same prayer 50 times in a row. And why do they do it, Pastor Anderson? Look at the verse. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. They think that if they say it enough times, and if they say it 50 times or 100 times, God is going to hear their prayer, but God doesn't hear you for your much speaking. The Bible says that God, well, we'll get into later who God hears and who God listens to. But the Bible says here, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. And here's the funny part. After this manner... What does manner mean? It means in this way, in this type prayer. He says, after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven. And then people chant this prayer. I mean, is that amazing? I mean, isn't that ironic? That he sits there and says, don't repeat things over and over. Don't use some vain repetition. I am not going to hear you just because you talked for an hour and said the same thing over and over again. And then they turn around and the next verse he says, pray something like this. And then they chant that exact prayer. Is that just unbelievable how people twist the Word of God? And they take the example prayer and they chant it. Well, you know, mindlessly, you know, you go to a church service, everybody stands up mindlessly. Oh, Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, if this is in heaven. It's weird. It's heathen. It's ungodly. That's what Jesus Christ said. And you say, well, yeah, we're not Roman Catholic, but we do that at our church. Hey, be not ye therefore like unto them. 
Why do you, why are you acting like a Catholic then? That's what he's saying. And so I don't want anything about this church to remind you of the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church is a heathen church. And I don't mind saying that. Did you figure that out yet? Uh, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have needed before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I love how Jesus' pattern prayer starts out with respect for God. I get so tired of people dragging God's name down in the gutter. J.C. Don't ever call the Lord Jesus Christ J.C. in my presence. Don't ever call him the old man upstairs. J.C. You know, we live in a day where people try to drag God's name down in some kind of a cuss word. Oh my God. Right? That's blasphemy, my friend. You shouldn't blow off your mouth about God's name, whether it be his name, Jesus. Or did you know that God is one of his names? Did you know that in the King James Bible, you read the Old Testament, it has God in capital G, capital O, capital D. That's a name of God. And when you just throw it around and blow off your mouth about, hey, speak about God with respect. Don't joke. Uh, I'm tired of blasphemous jokes about Jesus. Oh, it's funny. There's nothing funny about Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus is not a joke. I love the way it starts out with respect. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us. See, that's prayer. Give me something. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now flip over, if you would, to James chapter 5. James chapter number 5. And we'll see the example of a great man of the Old Testament who was a a great man of prayer. James chapter number 5. And look, if you would, at verse number 16. Now remember, we we don't want our prayer life, because the purpose of this sermon is not just to tell you to pray. Although that would be important to preach a whole sermon just telling you why it's so necessary and why it's so vital for you to spend time praying. But the part of the scope of this sermon is to teach you, as Jesus did, how to pray. How to pray. What's the right kind of prayer? Is it a repetition? Is it chanting? Is it saying the same thing every night before you go to bed? Is that the kind of prayer that God wants you to make? Well, Elijah, in verse number uh, 16 of chapter 5, we'll read this. It says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed. Look at these words. The effectual, fervent prayer. Of a righteous man availed much. Does it say prayer availed much? Or no? No. The fervent prayer. Now, do you know what fervent means? Look at the first three letters of the word fervent. F-E-R. The word fervent is related to the word fire. F-I-R-E. You'll notice that uh, in Daniel chapter... Well, the Bible talks about fervent heat in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. That one day God's going to burn the entire world. And that the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. Remember the fervent heat of the furnace? that was turned up in Daniel chapter 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You see, fervency is a burning, fiery kind of a passion where you're praying with some fire. You're praying fervently. The effectual, what does effectual mean? It means it produces effects. I mean, it has results. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. Boy, there's a lot of... A lot of conditions here on this, right? It's got, it needs to be effectual, it needs to be fervent, and you better be righteous when you're praying. Of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man, Elijah is Elias, sir. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. He wasn't some kind of a superhuman. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly. See that word? He prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Can you please step out with the baby in the back? Thanks. And so, here we have a man, can you imagine this? Getting on his knees before God, and praying for it not to rain for three and a half years. Can you imagine having that kind of a prayer answered? I mean, this reminds me again of Joshua, in Joshua chapter number 10, where he got on his knees and said, Son, stand thou still upon Gideon. And the Bible says that God hearkened to the voice of a man and made the sun stand still for 24 hours. Well, that's prayer, isn't it? That's power with God. I mean, a man who could pray that God would shut up heaven, that it would not rain on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Flip back, if you would, to 1 Kings. Keep your finger there. And flip back in the Bible to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter number 18. I'm sorry, 1 Kings chapter 17. 
And listen to the faith of Elijah. Now remember, he's praying that it would not rain on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Look what he says in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. The Bible says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. So here's a man who had faith that what God had said he was able to do, he was able to perform. When he prayed that God would do it, he knew God had answered his prayer and that God had the power to do that. He had the faith to say that publicly to the world and to say that to the king of Israel himself, that it will not rain until I say it's going to rain. Flip over, if you would, to chapter 18. Well, I don't want to go through this whole story just for sake of time. But here's the story of the face-off between Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And if you remember, they said, let's see who God really is, Elijah said. Let's see whose God is real. Let's see if Baal's real or if God, Jehovah, the Lord Jesus Christ is real. And so what did he do? He said, I'm going to have you build this altar and put wood on it and put your sacrifice on it. I'm going to do the same thing. And whichever God answers by fire from heaven, that's going to be the real God. And if you remember, the Baal worshippers, they started out in the morning. And they laid out the wood, they laid out the sacrifice on the altar. And they began to call upon Baal. Look, if you would, at chapter 18, and look at verse number 26. It says, And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal. Baal is Satan, in case you didn't know that. He's also called Baal Zebub or Beelzebub. Baal is when they worship Satan. It says, And called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon. That's six hours. Saying, O oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he's a god. Either he's talking, or he's pursuing, or he's in a journey. Or peradventure he's sleeping and must be away. Wake him up. Huh? Why doesn't your God hear you? And so here they thought that they were going to be heard for their much speaking. I mean, they're praying for six hours. They're leaping on the altar. They're jumping around. It's a charismatic church. You know, they're going, oh, you know, bouncing around, yelling, laughing hysterically, barking like a dog, slapping people on the forehead. And they're trying to get God to answer them. And Elijah begins to mock them. And look what it says in verse number 28. This gets them even more fervent. Boy, they were fervent too, though. And it says, and they cried aloud and cut themselves. And you think God ever condones in the Bible cutting yourself? Never. Only people who are demon-possessed in the Bible cut themselves. And did you know that people cut themselves in 2007? You ever seen people with it? When I was in high school, I remember there were girls in high school who would have cuts on their arms, scabbed over wounds where they would cut themselves. And they said, oh, it's this emotional trauma they're going to do. No, they're demon-possessed because they're listening to a bunch of demon-possessed music because they worship the devil and listen to a bunch of nine-inch nails and on and on and on. But it says they cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was passed, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, which is 6 p.m., so it's been all day, that there was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And I, I don't want to read the whole thing just for sake of time, but he had them uh, build up the altar of the Lord with whole stones, as God had said, lay the wood in order, uh, lay the animal in order, and then he had them dump. Twelve giant buckets of water on top of the altar. Now, is water very conducive to things igniting and lighting on fire? No. He had to pour water on it. Twelve giant barrels of water. And when he finishes that, the Bible says, let me find my place here. It says in verse number 36, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Sixty-three words, not twelve hours, not cutting himself and dancing around. He just got on his knees and prayed for sixty-three words. And the Bible says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. And Elijah said to them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the book Kishon and slew them there. Now, and then in verse number 41, he says, And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink. For there is a sound of abundance of rain. 
And then he goes, after this story, and he goes and gets on his knees, and he goes up to a mountain and he prays for the rain to come. And he prays and prays, and a little cloud comes, and he prays more, and it begins to just torrentiously rain on the land of Israel. He was a man who had power with God. A man who could get on his knees and pray for 63 words and have God's power come down. See, it's not necessarily just a quantity of prayer. Now, I do believe that you should spend... Uh, extended periods of time in prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. Huh? The Bible talks about the disciples, Peter and John, going to the temple in Acts chapter 3 at the hour of prayer. Uh, the Bible talks about Jesus praying all night. The Bible told uh, Jesus said to Peter, could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. He said, I want you to pray for an hour. Now I believe in, in praying for extended periods of time. People in the Bible prayed for days, prayed all night, prayed for hours. But I'm going to tell you something. God will not hear your prayer simply because of much speaking or repetition or because you talked for a long time. God wants you to pray an effectual, fervent prayer. Let me give you an example. I was thinking about this. We've all been in churches, if you've grown up in church, where there, you know, there's an unsaved spouse. It's a sad thing. You know, the wife and kids come to church... And they're saved, and they, they know Jesus Christ, their Savior, but maybe their husband, her husband is not saved. And he never comes to church, doesn't want to hear the gospel, he's an unbeliever. Or vice versa. I've seen cases, I remember a church that I was in where there was a man, he brought the kids to church, he was saved, he was a believer, and his wife was just an unbeliever. And would not come to church, and did not want to hear the, uh, the gospel, did not want to be saved. And you've all heard of situations like that, or known people that were in that situation. Relatives of mine, people that I've known. Well, I remember a case in particular where there was, a, there was somebody and, and her husband was unsaved. And the children and their dad was unsaved, you know, and he never comes to church. And what they do, they prayed all the time. They always had a prayer request, you know, pray for so-and-so to get saved. Pray for so-and-so to get saved. Pray for so-and-so. But they never really did anything to get him saved that I could see. They never gave him the gospel. You know, just... Uh, pray that he'll get saved. 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 For years and years and years and years. Now, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be rude or anything, but I'll put this to you. Just saying some prayer before you go to bed at night and saying, help so-and-so to get saved, amen. That could, be, that could become a vain repetition. I mean, if you don't have any heart behind it, if you don't have any fervency behind it, and you're just constantly praying. I prayed every day for the last 20 years that such and such would happen, and nothing happened. You, just because you repeated words every day doesn't mean that you really prayed. doesn't mean that you really talked to God. doesn't really mean that you were begging God for something. You know, this exact same person, me and my, me and my good friend Roger Jimenez. And, you know, people had gone over and given him some weak attempt at getting him saved. And he did not get saved, did not get saved, but they were praying. prayed for 20 years. Okay. Me and my friend Roger Jimenez got in the car. And I said, we were sitting at lunch at a Mexican restaurant, and I, I looked, you know, he likes, he's a Hispanic, he likes Mexican food, you know, we're eating Mexican food, and I, I looked across the table at him, and I said, let's go right now, this is exactly the way it happened, we were talking about something different, I said, you know what, let's go right now and let's get old so-and-so saved, huh, let's go do it right now, that's what we're going to do right now, we're going to go get him saved, and he said, okay, sure, let's do it, you know, so we dropped his wife off at the house, and we drove like almost an hour. Where this guy lived, just totally unannounced, just totally out of the blue. And what we do? We pulled in front of his house, and we got out of the car, and we. I said, "Let's kneel right here on the front lawn of his of his house, and let's pray right here on the front lawn. Let's get on our knees." So we just, you know, just in the middle of the street, we just walk up, we get on our knees in the lawn, and prayed for about, you know, 20 minutes probably. You know, he, I prayed, he prayed. You know, we're praying and we're begging God. You're saying, oh God, you know, please help him to be home. And it, and it didn't even look like there was a car in the driveway. And it didn't look like the light was on, but we're like, God did not bring us here for nothing, okay? And so we're like, oh God, you know, please help him to be there. Help him to be the only one home. Help there to be no distractions. God, would you please let him listen to us? Would you please just uh, make him, just put aside his preconceived idea and just at least hear us out, God? And would you convict him and help him realize he's not saved and but we begged God I mean, we drove all the way out there we're begging God for like 15 or 20 minutes I mean it wasn't that extended of a session but 15 or 20 minutes of just praying and begging God we got up we walked up to the front door it was the wrong house <laughs> we, had the, we had the address wrong okay so we get in the car and we drove down the street about you know a quarter mile or an eighth of a mile or whatever and there was the right house the light was on I go, oh, this is good anyway, you know, we're at the wrong house. 
So we, we pull in front of the house. No, we did not get out and pray again. Okay. So we got out. We walk up to the door. Knock on the door. Lo and behold, he's the only one home. He was a little surprised to see us. He didn't know why we were there. And he said, come on in. We sat down with him. We talked to him. We preached the gospel to him. And he got saved about 25 minutes later. Okay? Why? Well, you, say, well, you say, what was the difference? The difference is that we obeyed God. We didn't just pray some chant so that God would just do it all for us. I mean, hey, we went there and we got the job done. That's what it was. We, you see, if you pray, and, and this is kind of silly to me, so I feel pray for people to get saved. I mean, do you realize that you can't really pray that somebody's going to get saved because that has to be their choice? I mean, think about it. Do you think God can force somebody to get saved? No. Do you think God is going to physically appear to them in an apparition and get them saved themselves? No. I mean, you can't pray that God makes someone get saved, okay? You can pray. What were we praying? I told you what we were praying. That he's going to be there. That he's going to be home alone. That he's going to listen to us. That he's going to be convicted by the Holy Ghost of God. That he's going to be ready to listen. That he's not going to shut us down before we have a chance to speak to him. Uh, we prayed a long litany of things, and our case of God answered our prayer. But we didn't just pray. We also obeyed God and opened our mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And we preached the gospel. That's how you're going to get somebody saved, is by opening your mouth and preaching the gospel. Yes, prayer. But you've got to put something behind the prayer like preaching, like getting them saved. And so this man got saved. And isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that the same people who have been praying for 20 years for him to get saved called him and told him that he got saved and they didn't believe us? Not a very effectual prayer. When you pray and you don't even believe the answer when it comes. You pray for something and then it happens and you don't believe it. You see... That's not the kind of prayer. See, I believed that God was going to answer my prayer. That's why I drove for two hours, you know, an hour there, an hour back. That's why I kneeled on some stranger's lawn and prayed for 20 minutes. Okay. Why? Because I thought it was going to work. Because I believed that God was going to answer my prayer. I didn't know if he was going to get saved or not. But I believed that God would answer my prayer and that God would hear me. I was thinking about another time, uh, me and a friend of mine, uh, we were on a bus route. You know, this was a church that had bus routes. And uh, it was snowing outside and there was snow everywhere. And we went out on the bus route, and it was just one of those days that was just a flop. You know, you ever have one of those days where just everything is not working? We're getting stuck, and the, the bus is stuck in the snow. No one is coming to church. The bus is just completely empty. No one was coming. Nobody wanted to come. Everybody who said they were going to come was not coming. We're stuck in the snow. Everything's going horrible. And I said to this, my friend, I said, hey, let's go on the, let's just, I said, let's just step to the back of the bus, just me and you, and let's just get on our knees in the back of the bus and just pray for a while. And just pray that God will do something. You know, that God will turn this thing around. I remember we prayed and prayed. And, you know, none of the people came. It still was a dud. The van, the, the thing was still stuck, the bus. But, you know, a couple of kids came up and walked, knocked on our window. And they were just like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why do you guys have this bus here? Why are you stuck in the snow? And we got out and we were able to win them to the Lord. And they came searching out baptized. See, God answered our prayer, not even really what we were asking for. But when we got on our knees and prayed, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them, the Bible says. And if, if we agree on earth as touching anything, it should be done for us of our Father which is in heaven. And we got together and we prayed on our knees and asked God to do something. He did. There have been other times when I was out knocking doors, sowing, nobody was getting saved. And we would, we would get on our knees in the street, in broad daylight, in the middle of the street, and just get on our knees on the sidewalk and start praying. Humbling ourselves before God and saying, God, I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care if people think we're crazy right now. Because we know that it's you that's going to make something happen right now. If we get on our knees and ask you to do it, you're going to do it for us. You're going to help us. You're going to lead us. And it may not be exactly what we want you to do. But you're going to do something. Because everyone that asks it receive it. I know you're going to answer our prayers. I remember uh, praying for my wife to be saved. Before we were married, you know, when I just knew her as a friend and acquaintance, I prayed and begged God for her to be saved. You say, wait, I thought you can't pray for people to be saved. You know what? You know what I prayed? And I talked to a preacher one time, and he taught me this. And he said, if you really want to get somebody saved, he said, you, you pick one person that you really want to get saved, maybe like a really hard case. Somebody that people say, this guy's never going to get saved. And he said, here's what I do. I pick somebody like that, and I take an hour every day, and I, he's not, I said, I can't do this permanently. You know, I can't take an hour every day to pray for this one person. But he said, I'll just set a time, maybe a few days, or maybe a week, or maybe even two weeks. 
and I'll do some fasting. And he said, I just pray for that one person. I just set aside an hour and just target all my prayer on that one person. Now, he wasn't saying to chant for an hour. God helps so-and-so to get saved. God helps so-and-so to get saved. God. He said, what I did is I formulated a list. And this is what he told me. He said, I made a list of a hundred things to pray for somebody who's not saved that God can do. Because God cannot make people get saved. If you believe that God can make people get saved, you're wrong. If you believe that God can get people saved without you and without me, you are wrong. No one has... The only time you could say that somebody got saved by God alone was when Jesus Christ was on this earth because he was the human instrument that God was using because he was 100% man and 100% God. But to say that God just goes out and gets people saved without a human vessel? No. God has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. Getting people saved is something where we get in the yoke with Jesus. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And I believe that. It's the power of God that gets somebody saved. Jesus Christ is the Savior. It's the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Ghost. Jesus and the Holy Ghost and the Father are the one who works salvation. But God has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. And unless we team up with God and obey God and preach the gospel, how shall they hear without a preacher? Is what the Bible says. They must have God and man working together to win souls. That's the Christian life. And so, he had this list of things that he made. And he never he didn't show me the list. I didn't see the list. But I made my own list. And I couldn't think of a hundred things. Okay. But he prayed a hundred things that God could do to help someone get saved. He prayed things like, well, this, actually this is my list because I didn't get his list. But I prayed that every Bible verse that this person's ever heard, would just come back into their mind and just keep coming back to them, that God would bring it to remembrance and that the Holy Spirit would use those verses to convict them. You know, verses that I'd given them to them when I'd given them the gospel. Verses I'd showed them out of the Bible about salvation, that it would just keep coming back in their mind and they just wouldn't be able to get it out of their mind. I prayed that God would keep people up at night. That they'd try to go to sleep and that they couldn't sleep. And that they'd toss and turn in their bed and wonder, what's going to happen to me when I die? Am I going to go to hell? I mean, is hell real? And I would pray that God would, would bring that home to them. I would pray that God would remove any kind of obstacle that's keeping them from getting saved. Maybe a bad friend that's a bad influence on them. I'd pray that God would, uh, if, they, if their job was, was somehow a hindrance to them, take that away from them. i pray that if it took them, uh, if God, if they have to get in a car wreck and go to the hospital, send the car wreck. Uh, send the surgery. Send the, the sickness. Because maybe if they're in the hospital, they'll listen to me when I give them the gospel and get saved. i say, God, whatever it takes, do what it takes. To bring this person down and humble them to the point where they're ready to get saved. My own grandpa was a very, he was a very rich man when he was a young man. He owned a, a, a Sherwin-Williams paint store in uh, Los Angeles, California. He also owned a neon sign business. He was an electrician. He, uh, he, he also owned a, a business where he was fabricating these uh, metal trailers for, who's ever heard of Hot Dog on a Stick? You ever been to those in, in Los Angeles? Do they have it around here? Is it here too? And they had the fresh squeezed lemonade and they dressed real goofy with red, yellow, and blue outfits and everything. Well, when they first came out, way back when, in the 1950s or whenever, or not, not even the 50s, I don't know, somewhere around there. When they first came out, my grandpa and another guy, they, he made the trailers for them that they used to sell the, the corn dogs out of. And he was selling them for like some huge amount of money each and he was making them real fast. And so he had a lot of money. I mean, he had a lot of money. I forget the exact figure. But it was, it would, if, he was making that much, if he were making that much today, it would be a lot of money. And this is back in the 50s. I mean, he's a very rich man. But he was unsaved. He's an unbeliever. But his wife had gotten saved. And his wife was saved, but he and the kids were not saved. And she prayed to God. And I've, she's told me this story. My dad's told me this story. My grandpa's told me this story. She prayed to God and said, God, and this is my own grandmother. She said, God, she said, whatever it takes for Andy to get saved... She said, whatever it takes, just do it. You know? And she said, if it means losing all his money, if he has to lose everything, then go ahead and take all the money away, because I know that it's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And she said, if it, if it takes him losing all his money, then take away all the money. I'm willing to, to live a lesser lifestyle if he'll get saved. And you know what? That's exactly what happened. He, said, he got into drinking. And he drank up a lot of the money, and he started wasting a lot of money, and a bunch of his employees at his different businesses started stealing from him, and his whole businesses fell apart, and he never, it's, and, and he lost all his money, and around the same time, 
some uh, door-to-door soul winners from a church faith back to church at Canoga Park came by and talked to him. And I'm not sure who it was. I think it might have been the pastor himself, Pastor Rasmussen, that won my grandpa the Lord. Because he had to lose everything. And she knew what to pray. She prayed that God would do something. And she was willing to make the sacrifice of some of the money that she was enjoying. She was willing to give something up to have God answer her prayer. And he got saved. And he became a great soul winner, became a deacon in that church, became a preacher, and won people to the Lord by the droves. And I went back to that church in L.A. about, I think it was about six years ago, and two different people, totally independently, said, you know what, the one thing I remember about your grandpa is that he sure knocked a lot of doors. He sure won a lot of people to Christ. He won, he, they, this is what they said, he won people to the Lord that were the hard cases. He would get them saved. They'd call him in, and he'd get them saved. He preached the gospel to him. Why? Because somebody knew how to pray. That's why. Because my grandma knew how to pray. That's why he got saved. And he lost everything so that he could be saved. And, you know, he never had money again for the rest of his life. I mean, he was just lived a very average life for the rest of his life. Never had money like that ever again. You know, I pray. One of the things on my list is I pray that God will give me another opportunity to give the gospel to that person. Another opportunity. Because before I start praying for somebody to get saved, I give them the gospel. You know, I'm going to give them the gospel before I spend days and days and weeks trying to get them saved. Hey, first I'm going to give them the gospel, and then I'm going to continue to pray if, that doesn't, if they don't receive it the first time. Pray that others will come also. I pray, you know, God, if, if I'm not going to be the one to get this person saved, would you send somebody else? That's a very scriptural prayer. Because the Bible says, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And every time, there are people right now that I want to be saved. And every time I win somebody to the Lord, that's a complete stranger, where I knock on the door of some stranger, and I win them to the Lord, I say to God, okay God, I just want somebody to the Lord. Will you send somebody to win the person that I want saved to the Lord? Will you answer my prayer? I answered your prayer, Jesus Christ, when you prayed for not only those that were believers, but he said, but those who would believe because of their word. I'm answering Jesus' prayer. When he prayed for the laborers to be in the harvest, I want him to answer my prayer and win my loved one to the Lord because I want somebody else's loved one to the Lord. And so there's a long list. I'm not going to go on and on, but I prayed just thing after thing and begged God. And I'm telling you, whenever I prayed like that, it always worked. Always. I mean, if I spent just like an hour a day for several days, I mean, good night. You think God's not going to hear that kind of a prayer, a fervent prayer, begging God? He'll listen to you. He'll answer you. You say, if God never answers my prayers, you, then you have a problem. Maybe you're not a righteous man. Or maybe, maybe you need to get some sin out of your life. Or maybe you need to uh, pray a little more fervently. Or maybe you need to do something. Because the Bible says, everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh find it. And in the knock it shall be opened. 1 John 5.14, flip over there if you would. The Bible says, in 1 John 5.14, and we just talked about this last Sunday night, but I'm going to emphasize it again. Of course, 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. Flip back, if you would, to 1 John chapter 3, and look at verse number 20. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 24, If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Remember he said, whatsoever we ask, or I'm, I'm sorry, in verse number uh, 14 of chapter 5, he said, we know that if he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we desire of him. Well, back in 1 John 3, he says, If our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Remember, this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. We have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, 1 John 3.22, because we keep His commandments. Do you see that? Whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Now, one of the ways that you're going to get God to answer your prayers, one of the ways that you're going to have confidence is if your heart doesn't condemn you. You say, why would my heart condemn me? When you've done something that you know is wrong and you refuse to repent of it, you refuse to get right with God, you have a sin in your life that you're refusing to acknowledge 
and confess and forsake, and when you have that sin in your heart, you don't have the confidence to go to God and ask Him for something and know that when you get up off your knees, God has heard and answered your prayer. But whatsoever we ask, John is saying, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments. Because we keep His commandments. Because we keep His commandments, he's saying, and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Why do you think Jesus always, every prayer was always answered? Remember he said when he asked God to, uh, he prayed to God about uh, Lazarus raising from the dead in John 11. He said, I know that you always hear me, God. But he said, I said, I said it for the sake of those that are here. You know, that they would hear me pray and know that, that you've sent me. Why did Jesus know that God the Father always heard his prayer? Okay, because Jesus was sinlessly perfect. And he said, I do always those things which please my Father. That's how he had the confidence to know that anything that he asked of the Father, and of course we know Jesus is God, the Trinity, we believe that the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are, are one, is what the Bible says. One God. But he said, I always do the things that please the Father, and that's how I know that he always hears me, and every prayer that I ever pray will be answered. And so to the degree that you keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight, can you claim the promise of the confidence of knowing that whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. But here's another uh, ingredient. Look back at Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter number 9. So number one, we saw that, that you know, prayerlessness and a lack of prayer is actually a sin. And that it's keeping us from having the things in our life that God wants us to have, according to James 4. God wants us to have the great victories. God wants us to see the miracles and the power of God. He wants us to see our friends and loved ones saved or have the opportunity to preach the gospel to them and, and see great things happen. He wants our church to grow. He wants your kids to grow up and live for God. He wants you to succeed uh, spiritually. But he says you must pray in order to see that happen. It's not public prayer that's going to make it happen. There's a time for public prayer. There's public prayer in the Bible. But he says the biggest prayer is you in your closet. Shut the door. Lock it. Pray to your Father which is in secret. Nobody knows about it except you and God. Don't use a vain repetition. Pray with fervency and passion and, and great desire. But look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. There's another thing that I think sometimes all of us are missing in our prayer life. Look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. The Bible says, and here's a man of great prayer, Daniel. All throughout the book of Daniel you'll see this. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereby the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the destruction of Jerusalem. Watch this. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. You see that? That's a humble, that's a serious attitude. That's not, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, please help so and so to get saved. Well, this is serious prayer. This is him uh, forsaking food and fasting. This is him in sackcloth and ashes mourning crying, weeping. Huh? It, 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 it. Life is not just a game. It's not just a big joke. You know, we live in a day where the people who want to be popular, the people who want everybody to like them, whether it's a preacher, whether it's friends at school, whether it's people at work, it's always the guy who's just smiling all the Hey, how you doing, buddy? Hey, always happy. Ha, 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 fun, fun, rah, rah, laugh, laugh, fun, fun. You know, that's not what life is all about. You know that's not a good quality. There's this. I remember there's this. Uh, there's this thrift store by my house in California, and they had a TV screen by the register, and they were they were some kind of Christians or whatever so called, and they had this video playing all the time, and it was like a Jesus film. You know these pictures. You know these movies about this this long haired sissy hippies walking around. He's Jesus, and and uh, Peter has like a big afro. You know what I'm talking about? They all have long hair. They all look like girls. They're all wearing dresses. I mean, they're, they're literally wearing, like, skirts and dresses. And uh, supposedly that's the way they dressed back then. And they all wore skirts. Men wore skirts. And they all had long hair. No, I, I don't believe that for a second. I think you're, you're mixed up. I think I was back in the 70s or something. But uh, well, that's when the movie was made. But in this movie, and I've heard people joke about this movie, this exact movie. And I forget what it's actually called. But it's, it's, it's called, I think it might be called The Jesus Film. Or I don't know what it's called. It's, it might... I might be blasphemy, I don't know. 
w- whatever movie that's, I don't know. But this movie is called the Smiling Jesus movie, is what people mockingly would call it. Because Jesus in this movie, and I, I would see it just when I'm buying stuff at the register and the thrift store, he's just grinning all the time. I mean, he'll be like preaching against the Pharisees with a big smile on his face. I mean, it's almost, it's almost silly to see this. Has anybody ever seen that before? Okay, well, I've seen it. I've heard other people in churches talk about, oh, yeah, it's that Smiling Jesus movie. And he's just walking around. He's like, you hypocrites. <laughs> you vipers. Go to hell. You know, Jesus is preaching all this stuff. And he's grinning and smiling the whole time. And that's the impression that people have of Jesus. Happy all the time. Smiling all the time. You know, the Bible says that the, the fools spend their time in the house of feasting. But he said the wise spend time in the house of mourning. Huh? By the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. God says your heart will be made better if you get sad for a while. Uh, and James, I have to read this for you, but he says, Be afflicted, I can't find it, but be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. In, ver- in chapter 4, the same one that's about prayer. Humble yourself. Hey, turn your laughter into mourning. Uh, Turn your joy into heaviness. You can't go through life happy all the time, laughing and smiling all the time. There's a time when you need to mourn and weep before God and say, Oh God, answer my prayer. Oh God, save our nation. Oh God, help my family to to be lifted out of the the mire of sin and filth. Help people to be saved. Hey, do something with our church. It's not all just a fun and joke about life. Did you ever read this and notice that if you were to put a genre on the Bible, it wouldn't be comedy? How much of the Bible is really that funny? I mean, you read the Bible every couple months, every couple weeks, something will strike you funny in the Bible. But you know, when I'm reading the Bible, I'm not falling out of my chair laughing. (laughs) Can you imagine that? Is is that the tone that the Bible is written in? The Bible is a very serious book. And we live in this day where everything's funny. Everything's a joke. Everything's ha-ha. And I'm going to tell you something. That's not the way the life is supposed to be. Nothing that I can't stand more than somebody who doesn't know how to be serious. Now, I joke around a lot. And if you come to this church, you know that I joke around and cut up in the sermon sometimes. But, you know, I know how to be serious, too. And life's not a joke to me. And the Bible says uh, the man of God should be grave, grave, sober, grave. You know, grave isn't, isn't anything to laugh about, is it? The word grave means serious, and you say, how serious? Like, as serious as somebody who's died and been buried. You don't see people laughing at the cemetery, laughing at a graveyard, because there's nothing funny about it. It's death. And so we see Daniel here mourning and weeping before God. You know, that's the kind of serious, fervent prayer that God wants. Earnest prayer. Earnest means serious. That's what the word earnest means. Look at Daniel chapter 10. We'll see this again. Flip over to Daniel 10, verse 1. The Bible says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning. You see that? Mourning, weeping, sad. He was upset. He was in heaviness. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning. Three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread. Neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. He said, I didn't even take a shower. Huh? I was mourning. I was in sackcloth and ashes. I mean, these people would put on sackcloth. Like a, like a sack, like a potato sack. I mean, they would take off their nice clothes and put on a, 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 an ugly garment of just weeping and sadness. They would put ashes on their head, the Bible says. They would get on their face and cry before God because they were so upset about the, what would happen to his country. Huh? He was so upset about the fact that God was not answering his prayer, he thought. That he mourned for three full weeks. And at the end of the three weeks, God sends the answer to his prayer and says, Daniel, I answered you the first day you start praying. If you read the rest of the chapter, you see this in chapter 10. But he says it just took three weeks for the answer to get here. But the first day I had already answered your prayer is what God says later on in the chapter in Daniel 10. You read that on your own time. But we're taught. Aren't we always taught, though? Everything's about happiness. I was on an airplane on uh, Friday night. I was coming home, and I was... I was telling the, the lady and her husband that were sitting next to me, it was the lady who was sitting here and then her husband was sitting here, and I was telling them about church, and, and they went to a church, uh, some kind of community church, and I was giving them the gospel, trying to get them saved. 
And as I was explaining this to her, the woman said to me, she said, well, as long as it, as long as it makes you happy, you know, what you believe, that's all that matters, right? And I just laughed. I mean, I burst out laughing. You know, I know I'm supposed to be serious, but I burst out laughing. I said, no. <laughs> all that matters is whether you're happy. But that's what probably most of the world thinks, right? Whatever religion makes you happy, whatever church makes you happy, this church will not always make you happy. Have you noticed that? Did you notice that you might walk out of Faithful Word Baptist Church sometimes and you're not happy? Well, then go to, go to Happy Smiley Church down the street. Go to Little Happy Smiley World where they'll never tell you the truth. They won't preach anything negative. They'll never talk about hell. They'll never talk about sin. They'll never preach against anything that you've ever done. Because God just loves sin and loves the devil and, and loves everybody and everything's wonderful. Look, there's a time that you need to pray and it's not some ditty. It's not a chant. It's not a vain repetition. It's where you get on your face like Daniel did and you mourn and you weep and you cry out to God and ask God to do something. And you get serious. Put away the jokes. Put away the Comedy Central. Get serious. Listen to this. Hebrews chapter 5. The Bible says in verse 7, you don't have to turn there, but who in the days of his flesh, this is speaking of Jesus Christ, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. That's Jesus' prayer. Did you hear that? Strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard and that he feared. Though he were a son, he had learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Mark 1.35 And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, this is Jesus, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Luke 5.16 And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. That's Jesus Christ. Luke 22.40 And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down. He's by himself. He separates himself from the group when he goes to do serious praying. All throughout the Bible you'll see that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus will go separate himself even from his disciples and pray alone to his Father. And it says, He was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing... Remove this cup from me, nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. This is Jesus praying earnestly. And the Bible says that his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, and he was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow and said to them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. But the Bible says in Psalm 66, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. There's the, whatsoever we ask we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. But if we regard iniquity in our heart, David said, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's David. That's a saved, born-again Christian who was a man after God's own heart. He said, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Proverbs 28.9 He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Now that's the truth. And I'll close with this one verse. Acts 4.31 And when they had prayed... Famous verse. When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. What was the power of the early church? Why did the early church see so many multitudes saved? Why is it that they preached the gospel so boldly? Why is it that they were beaten and thrown in jail and they stood up boldly and said, Neither is there salvation in any other, but there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, the Bible says, they took knowledge of them that they'd been with Jesus. Hey, if you look at somebody, you want to know whether somebody's been with Jesus? You want to know whether somebody's been mourning and praying on their face to God? You want to know if somebody's filled with the Holy Spirit? Hey, do they speak the Word of God with boldness? Huh? Do they, hey, do they go out and they win the souls? And I'm not just talking about in church where everybody here, you know, supposedly loves God and wants to hear the Bible. I'm talking about out there boldly making known the mystery of the Gospel. Opening your mouth boldly to friends and loved ones, co-workers, people at the door, door-to-door soul winning. Hey, that's what I'm talking about. The boldness that comes with the light of spending time with God, being filled with the Spirit, spending time with Jesus, 
That's how you're going to get the boldness. That's how this... You say, what's going to make or break this church? Is it because we preach the whole Bible? Uncensored. Don't care what anybody thinks. We have a revolving door that spins both ways and people come to, and they go as fast as they come all the time, almost every week. But... We also have uh, door-to-door soul winning, right? We, we preach the gospel. We win people to the Lord. Uh, we also preach on sin and we try to live a clean and righteous and holy life. Huh? We try to follow God's commandments. But there's, there's an ingredient that we must also have, and that's prayer. We all, today, need to decide that we're going to take our prayer up a notch in this church. Agreed? We need to start going to God with an attitude of mourning. And you say, well, what are, what are we so upset about? Look outside. Drive down the street. Look at the way our country is. Open the newspaper. And then tell me that there's not something to mourn about. Look at the condition of your family. Look at the condition of your friends and loved ones. There's a lot that you should be begging God for. That's what's going to make or break this church. You see, one, any one, if we have one chink in the armor, this church will fail. We must have prayer. We must have Bible. We must have preaching the gospel. We must have the balance of all the pieces of the puzzle. Till we come to a perfect man, the Bible says. Understand that prayer is not an option. It's something that we need to go home and do. It's something that we need to commit ourselves to once again. A prayer that's effectual, that gets things done. A prayer from a heart that's grieving before God. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his seeds with him. Let's rejoice when we get the soul saved. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, Paul said. Let's weep before God in the prayer closet, and then let's go out and win the souls to Christ and rejoice, bringing our seeds with a praising God. Hey, I pray, I don't go through life in the doldrums. I praise God every day, but I also weep every day. Every day I praise God and I'm happy, and every day I'm sorrowful and mourning before God. We're sorrowful, but we're always rejoicing. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. God, we love you and thank you so much for giving us the great privilege of coming to you in prayer. What peace we often forfeit, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Father, there's so much power that you have, there's so much that you can do in our lives, there's so much that you can do in this church, but we have not because we ask not. And God, we've all been guilty of it. I'm guilty of not praying like I should, of not spending the time in communion with you that I should, asking you, asking you to do something, dear God. Please just help us all to understand that you have the answer to every question. You have the power to solve any problem. God, help us to take everything to you in prayer and to pray fervently with passion and zeal, to mourn and cry out to God seriously. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's sing Sweet Hour of Prayer before we go. Let's sing one last song. Sweet Hour of Prayer. It's on, it's on page number 301 in your songbook. Song number 301, Sweet Hour of Prayer.